In this lecture presentation, we will be discussing lipids. This is an outline for our discussion on lipids. We'll start off by looking at the structure and classification of lipids. And then we'll look at each of those classes of lipids individually, starting off with fatty acids and triacylglycerols. We'll then talk about membrane liquids. We'll talk about emulsification lipids, messenger lipids, and finally we'll end talking about protective coating lipids. Lipids are a class of substances with large structural diversity. In other words, the molecules look much different from one another. Therefore, scientists have actually categorized lipids based on their biochemical functions what they do in a living organism. The first category that we're going to discuss are the energy storage lipids. Most of those are often called triacylglycerols, and here is an example of a triacylglycerol right here. Notice I have four different areas that are highlighted here. In the top part in purple, that is my glycerol part of the molecule. And these green parts are my acyl groups here. And this is the structure of an ester. Here I have a carbonyl group and an OR group. If I expose those to conditions for hydrolysis, in other words, heat, water, and a catalyst or enzyme, I can do a hydrolysis reaction to that triacyl glycerol, where I break those ester linkages, forming an alcohol, in this case, a three carbon alcohol with three hydroxyl groups known as glycerol. And I form three fatty acids, three carboxylic acids. The second class of lipids are the membrane liquids. In other words, these are the lipids that make up cell membranes in animals. And we'll take a closer look at that in the chapter. They consist of glycerol phospholipids, a sphingophospholipid, a sphingoglycolipid, and cholesterol in here. Notice these also have groups here where I have a fatty acid, a fatty acid, and a fatty acid making up my esters. Or in these two cases, they make up amides here. And if we look at cholesterol, it looks nothing like either of these other three molecules, but they are part of the cell membrane. So they're a membrane liquid. The third class of Lipids are the chemical messenger lipids. These include steroids and hormones and eicosanoids. If I look at the chemical structure of a steroid and compare it to the chemical structure of an eicosanoid, they actually are very different. But they both have a very similar function within a living organism. They carry messages from one part of the body to another part of the body, often through the bloodstream. So we have cells that release these chemical messengers, either a steroid or an eicosanoid. They get transported to another part of the body where they tell those cells to do something, either to contract the muscle, send an electrical signal. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the chemical messenger section of this chapter. The fourth class of lipids are the emulsification lipids, often referred to as the bile acids. They are produced in the liver. You can, again, look at the structure of a bile acid. Notice that it contains a sulfur and a nitrogen and oxygen, plus this fused four-membered ring system here. The function of an emulsification lipid is to take fat globules within the body and break them up by actually causing them to be polar. So this part of the molecule tends to be a very polar part of this whole bile acid here, and it tends to break them up and make them soluble in water so they can be carried through the bloodstream. 
And the final classification based on function for lipids are the protective coating lipids, often referred to as biological waxes. If we look at the structure of a protective coating lipid, you can see it's got a very long carbon chain, one ester function down in here, and another very long carbon chain here, both of these being very nonpolar, being hydrophobic in nature, they don't like water. So plants tend to produce biological waxes, these protective coating lipids, to actually make it so that they repel water from the leaves and from the branches here to protect them from being swollen by water. Biological waxes. An alternative classification system to the system based on function is to divide lipids into two categories based on whether they are saponifiable or not. If we look at a saponification reaction, that's where I take an ester in the presence of a strong base and some water. I break that ester linkage here to produce a carboxylate salt and an alcohol. Or I can take an amide, react it with a strong base in the presence of water to break that amide linkage here to produce a carboxylate salt and an amine. Both of these are just hydrolysis reactions in the presence of a strong base. In other words, this is the same reaction we would use to make soap. Let's now take our lipid molecules and place them into two categories. One, are they saponifiable? Or two, are they not saponifiable? The saponifiable lipids are those lipids that contain either an ester linkage or an amide linkage. So if I look at the triacyl glycerol molecules, I can see I have esters. I can do hydrolysis reactions there. If I look at a glycerol phospholipid, they also can contain two ester linkages. If I look at sphingophospholipids, they contain one amide linkage, so it is saponifiable. The same thing is true with the sphingoglycolipid. It contains an amide linkage. And finally, the biological waxes, they are also esters. So these four molecules are saponifiable lipids. The non-saponifiable lipids are those that do not contain esters or amides. The bile acid does not contain an ester or an amide, steroid, cholesterol, and the eicosanoids. Let's now take a more in-depth look at the energy storage lipids. Specifically, we're going to look at the triacyl glycerols looking both at the chemistry and at the functionality of these molecules. If I look at the triacyl glycerol molecule, it is made up of four different components. And if I do a hydrolysis reaction, I can look at those four individually. Hydrolysis, breaking up those ester linkages by adding water across them, gives me a trialcohol called glycerol, and it gives me three fatty acids. It's these three fatty acids that can also vary in structure that give the properties of the triacyl glycerol. Those fatty acids could either be saturated fatty acids. In other words, all of the carbon-carbon bonds in that long carbon chain are all single bonds, or they can be unsaturated fatty acids where I either have one or more carbon-carbon double bonds in there. And then we can separate those out into two different subcategories. The monounsaturated fatty acids where I have just one double bond along that carbon-carbon chain there. Or I can have multiple carbon-carbon double bonds. We call those polyunsaturated fatty acids, often abbreviated PUFA, polyunsaturated fatty acids. And the monounsaturated fatty acids are often abbreviated MUFA.
Let's look at the saturated fatty acids where the carbon chain attached to the carboxylic acid is all carbon-carbon single bonds. These will always be linear. There's no branching involved in fatty acids. And we number the fatty acids starting at the carbonyl carbon here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So this fatty acid, if we were to name it using the IUPAC system, we'd say dodecanoic acid for 12 carbon carboxylic acid. Biochemists and nutritional chemists often call it lauric acid. That's the common name. So saturated fatty acids are often found in animal products such as butter, cheese, whole milk, ice cream, cream, fatty meats, and oil such as coconut oil, palm oil, and palm kernel oil. Monounsaturated fatty acids are fatty acids where that hydrophobic carbon chain contains one and only one carbon-carbon double bond. That is shown here in this structural formula of a fatty acid. Notice the double bond here is drawn in the cis configuration. That is because nature only makes cis fatty acids. But there are different ways we could depict it rather than the structural formula. We could just draw out this linear molecule. Notice here I'm not depicting it as cis or trans, but if it is a naturally occurring occurring fatty acid, it will be in the cis configuration. In this third molecular formula here, I've shown it sort of depicting it as the cis configuration here. This molecule, it contains 18 carbons, so it's going to be octadecanoic acid. And at carbon number 9, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, is where the double bond starts, and it's in the cis configuration. So putting that all together, we get cis-9-octadecanoic acid because it contains a double bond. Biologists, biochemists, and nutritional chemists know this as oleic acid, oleic acid. If we look at olive oil, greater than 70% of all the fatty acids in olive oil are oleic acid. Polyunsaturated fatty acids are fatty acids that contain more than one carbon-carbon double bond in that long hydrophobic carbon chain. An example of that would be this molecule. Again, this molecule has 18 carbon atoms, but it also contains three double bonds, all in the cis conformation. One way to identify this molecule shorthand is to write down the number of carbon atoms, followed by the number of carbon-carbon double bonds, and then followed by this delta sign here and the positions of those carbon-carbon double bonds. So this molecule contains 18 carbons, so we write down 18. It contains three double bonds, so we put colon three, then delta, and the position of each of those double bonds. Let's see, we get over to carbon number nine, number 12, and number 15. So the shorthand notation for this polyunsaturated fatty acid would be 18 colon three, delta, 9, 12, 15. Number of carbons, number of double bonds, position of the double bonds. You have probably heard of omega fatty acids. Omega fatty acids are unsaturated fatty acids and they have some structural similarities to them. If I look at the omega fatty acid, the reason they're called omega-3 is if I start at the opposite end of the molecule and I count one, two, three, I come to the first double bond here. So this is just a generic way of identifying omega-3 fatty acids. They all have this same structure where they have a final double bond that's one, two, three from the end. This fatty acid has 20 carbons in it and five double bonds. And if I use the 
nomenclature system here, the delta would be delta 5, 8, 11, 14, and 17. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. So this is the shorthand methodology for actually identifying this fatty acid. So in addition to being a 20 colon 5 delta 5, 8, 11, 14, 17 fatty acid, it is an omega-3 fatty acid. There are also a number of fatty acids that are omega-6 fatty acids. We use the same methodology to identify which of these molecules are omega-6. I start from the carbon-carbon chain end of it. I count up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. I get to my first double bond. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So each of these three can, are known as omega-6 fatty acids. However, let's look at the shorthand notation. This fatty acid contains 14 carbons. It contains one carbon-carbon double bond, so it's a monounsaturated fatty acid. So it has one double bond, and that starts at carbon number 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 carbons. This fatty acid has 18 carbons. It's got two double bonds. Those double bonds are at carbon number 12 and carbon number 9. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. This third fatty acid here has three double bonds on it. It has 20 carbons in it, so it's 20 colon 3. Those double bonds are at carbons number 8, 11, and 14. Let's just do some counting here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. And again, if I start from the other end, from the hydrophobic side, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, I start my first double bond. These are all omega-6 fatty acids. This is a table of some important fatty acids. Notice they have both saturated fatty acids, monounsaturated fatty acids, and polyunsaturated fatty acids. If I look at the structural notation for these fatty acids, I have a 12 carbon system with no double bonds. I have a 14 carbon system, no double bonds. 16 carbon, 18 carbon, 20 carbons in my saturated fatty acids. Biochemists and nutritional chemists often refer to these as lauric acid, myristic acid, palmitic acid, steric acid, and arachidic acid. If I look at two important monosaturated fatty acids, each containing one double bond in the hydrophobic long carbon chain. I have a 16 carbon fatty acid with one double bond at the ninth carbon. I have an 18 carbon fatty acid with one double bond at the ninth carbon. These would be omega-6 and omega-9 fatty acids. One of them is palmitoleic acid and the other one is oleic acid. We have five important polyunsaturated fatty acids that contain 18 carbons, 18 carbons, 20, 20, and 22 carbons, and they contain multiple double bonds here. Linoleic acid, linolenic acid, arachnidonic acid, icosopentanoic acid, docosahexaenoic acid, these are both omega-6 and omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids. Let's look at the fat composition of some selected foods or some selected oils. I've highlighted high percentage oils in some of these food products. For example, if I look at palm oil, 45% of that palm oil is made up of the saturated fatty acids palmitic oil, hence the name palm oil. If I look at beef fat, 20% of that beef fat is made out of the polysaturated steric fatty acid. In other words, like steer, we have 
be fat here. If I look at oils that have unsaturated fatty acids, if we look at canola oil, 53% of canola oil is oleic acid. 71% of olive oil is oleic acid. If I look at oils like walnut oil or so soybean oil, I have both 60 and 51% respectively are linoleic acid. That is an 18 carbon, two double bonds at carbon number nine and 12, so a polyunsaturated fatty acid. If we look at corn oil and sunflower oil, they, those also contain a very high percentage of linoleic acid. And also evening primrose oil and safflower oil contain a very high percentage of linoleic acid. These again are unsaturated fatty acids. Let's now do a practice exercise where for each of the following three fatty acids, let's list the classification, whether it's a saturated fatty acid, a monounsaturated fatty acid, or a polyunsaturated fatty acids. Let's then give the common name for that fatty acid. Then let's also give the shorthand designation for that fatty acid, the number of carbons, the number of double bonds, and the position of those double bonds. So if I look at this first molecule, I recognize that it has one double bond in it. So this is going to be a monounsaturated fatty acid. I count the carbon number of carbons. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. I might have to go back to the table and look that common name up, but this one would be oleic acid. It has 18 carbon atoms. It has its first double bond and only double bond at carbon number nine. So this would be 18 colon one delta nine as its shorthand designation for this fatty acid. Looking at this second fatty acid, there are no double bonds, so this is going to be a saturated fatty acid. This one happens to be myristic acid. And if I did this shorthand designation for that, I'm just going to write down the number of carbons. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. And it's got no double bonds, so I'm going to write down 14 colon 0. That identifies this as a saturated fatty acid because it's got a zero there. And finally, if I look at this fatty acid, I notice that there are four double bonds in the chemical structure. So this is a polyunsaturated fatty acid. I could also count from the end here and go one, two, three, four, five, six. This is an omega-6 fatty acid. I know it's got 20 carbons. I go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So this is going to be a arachidinonic acid, and it's going to be a 24 delta 5, 8, 11, and 14 as the shorthand designation for this fatty acid. If we look at any fatty acid, it has two sections to it. The hydrocarbon chains are hydrophobic. In other words, they do not like water. So this is the nonpolar end of the molecule, the hydrophobic end of the molecule. And it also has a carboxylic acid on one end, which is hydrophilic. It is very polar and it's got oxygens on it. So this is the part that likes water, hydrophilic. Since all fatty acids have one carboxylic acid, the size of that hydrocarbon chain determines whether it is water soluble or not. The longer the carbon chain, the less soluble in water is. The fact that we have both saturated fatty acids, monounsaturated fatty acids, and polyunsaturated fatty acids, these double bonds have little impact on water solubility. It does not change the polarity of this long carbon chain very much at all. 
Another important physical property of fatty acids are their melting points. That is the property that determines whether I have a solid at room temperature or a liquid at room temperature. That melting point depends both on the length of the carbon chain and also the number of double bonds present. And again, in nature, all these double bonds will be cis. If I look at saturated fatty acids, they all tend to be solids at room temperature. In other words, their melting points is greater than room temperature. An example of a fatty acid that is a solid at room temperature is steric acid, which is contained in fats like lard. It's a solid at room temperature. If I look at unsaturated fatty acids, all of them tend to be liquids at room temperature. Specifically, if I look at 18 carbon fatty acids, these ones all contain kinks in them because they contain a double bond in the cis configuration. Oleic acid has one kink in it because it's got one double bond. Its melting point is much lower than the saturated fatty acids because there is less London dispersion forces when the molecules come together. These molecules all tend to line up with each other, have high London dispersion forces. These ones, because of the kink, they have less London dispersion forces. If I put two kinks in the molecule, two double bonds, they even have a more curved nature and their melting points tend to be lower. If I look at linoleic acid, which has three double bonds in it, it even has a lower melting point. So unsaturated fatty acids tend to be oils. Saturated fatty acids tend to be fats or solids. And that's how we're going to distinguish them. Oils are liquids, fats are solids. Fatty acids, like other organic molecules, often undergo chemical reactions based on the functional groups of that molecule. If we look at fatty acids, we have saturated fatty acids. They all contain carboxylic acids. So do the monounsaturated fatty acids and the polyunsaturated fatty acids. One chemical reaction that carboxylic acids undergo is they react with alcohols in the presence of a catalyst in the beaker that catalyst would be something like sulfuric acid in living organisms that catalyst is an enzyme they undergo a reaction to form an ester and they spit out a small molecule of water so all carboxylic acids undergo chemical reactions to form esters or esterification reactions. A common alcohol in the animal kingdom is 1,2,3-propane triol, or also known as glycerol. Notice it contains three hydroxyl groups, so it's a trialcohol. If I react that with a fatty acid, I can react it with three fatty acids. In the presence of an enzyme, I can do an esterification reaction in a living organism to form the triester of glycerol or triacyl glycerol. Triacylglycerols are also known by the terms triglycerols or triglycerides by the general public, and they are the storage form of fatty acids in mammals. So often, when we have a blood test done, we measure the triglyceride levels. We're actually measuring the number of triacylglycerols. So high triglyceride levels have been linked to a higher risk for heart disease. But in general, triglycerides are just a way that mammals and lots of animals actually store energy. Fatty acids have a lot of carbon-carbon bonds, so we can actually break those bonds to get energy. If we combine them with a glycerol molecule to form those ester linkages,
we actually have a convenient way of storing that fatty acid in a small space. So triglycerides contain three fatty acid groups and one glycerol group. Here is an example of a fatty acid where my R group represents the long carbon chain that is attached to my carbonyl carbon. If my R group, my long carbon chain, are identical, in other words, if R is equal to R prime is equal to R double prime here, we call that a simple triacyl glycerol. These are rather rare in biological systems. Usually these alkyl groups here are different. If we look at a triacyl glycerol where my R groups are different, in other words, I have a saturated fatty acid with 18 carbons, I have a monounsaturated fatty acid with 18 carbons, and I have a polyunsaturated fatty acid with 18 carbons, that is more normal than having a simple triacyl glycerol. These are mixed systems. We refer to this as a mixed triglyceride. Let's look at the molecules that are involved in forming a mixed triacyl glycerol. I first start off with one saturated fatty acid, a polyunsaturated fatty acid, three double bonds, a monounsaturated fatty acid, and the glycerol molecule, my trialcohol, in the living organism, in the presence of an enzyme catalyst, those can combine to form ester linkages between my carboxylic acids and my alcohol to form a triacyl glycerol or a triglyceride. If we look at the structure of this triglyceride and look at it sort of in this ball and stick model here, I can see that I have one linear chain saturated fatty acid, I have a monounsaturated fatty acid with a kink, and I have a polyunsaturated fatty acid residue here with three kinks in it. It's these kinks that determine its physical property of a melting point, whether this triglyceride is a liquid, being an oil, or this triglyceride is a solid, being a fat. If I look at the two classes of triacyl glycerols based on melting point, we have both fats, which are solids, and oils, which are liquids. Those triacyl glycerols that have predominantly saturated fatty acids on them, linear chain fatty acids with no kinks, they tend to be solids or semi-solids at room temperature, in other words, fats. These generally are obtained from animal sources like pigs and cows and humans. And oil is a triacyl glyceride that is a liquid at room temperature, and they tend to contain unsaturated fatty acids, both monounsaturated or polyunsaturated fatty acids. Because they contain all these kinks in them, they have fewer London dispersion forces between molecules and therefore they have lower melting points. In other words, they are going to be liquids at room temperature. These are generally obtained from either plant sources or from fish. Both fats and oils tend to be colorless and they also tend to be odorless. We often look at food and we look at the fat content to decide whether that food is going to be good for us or not. This is a table where I list several different common food products and the percentage of fat in them. One can see that margarine, shown here in red, is very high in fat content, up to 80%. If I look at things like 
raw sausage or peanut butter, cheeses or hot dogs or hamburgers, they contain between 30 and 53 percent fats. If I looked at cooked hamburgers where some of the fat drips out or cooked ham, fish products, beef or chicken or cheeses uh, or some sort of different soups, they have fat contents typically between 4 and 20 percent. And then finally, if I look at cod fish, it is very low in fats, but also are things like milk and whole wheat bread and chicken noodle soup, very low in fan co fat content. However, we tend to think of whole milk as being high in fat. When we look at this, this is just one criteria for actually determining whether a food product is actually good for you or not based on the fat content. We also need to look at what type of fats are in there? Do we have saturated or do we have unsaturated fats? Do we have omega-3s or do we have omega-6 fats in them? Let's take a look at those. Studies have shown that both types of dietary fat and the amount of dietary fat are important in a balanced diet. For example, we recommend the daily intake of fats as being monounsaturated fats at 15%, polyunsaturated fats is 10, and saturated fats at less than 10%. Notice in this slide, we're calling everything a fat. That is based on what a nutritionist would call it, not a biochemist or an organic chemist, which we differentiate oils from fats. Nutritionists tend to just call them all fats. So if we look at what nutritionists consider good fats, monounsaturated fats with one double bond, omega-3 and omega-6 unsaturated fatty acids, and polyunsaturated fatty acids, those are considered good fats. If we look at bad fats, they tend to be categorized as the ones that are saturated fats. And then there's here's ones where we've not talked about, trans monounsaturated fats or trans fats. Those are ones that have been modified from the natural form of cis fats into trans fats, and we'll talk about that shortly. And also, we consider polyunsaturated fats bad fats. Oh, wait, polyunsaturated are on both sides. It depends on who you talk to that determines whether a polyunsaturated fat is good for you or a polyunsaturated fat is bad for you. There are still studies that are being done to actually determine that concentration or that percentage that would be good for a healthy diet. If we consider the composition of fats in several of the different cooking oils that you might use, and if we were to say that we were looking for an oil that contains a lot of monounsaturated fats and few, if any, saturated fats, we would look at oils like canola oil, safflower oil, or olive oil for cooking, which contain all over 60% monounsaturated fats and less than 20% saturated fats. Fats that we would consider bad for actually cooking would be lard, palm oil, butter fat, or coconut oil, which contains about 91% saturated fats. Notice, it's always good to have a mixed diet, so one often uses these oils based on the taste or based on the cooking temperature that these oils actually operate at. Studies have shown a strong correlation between diets that are high in fats and oils and the relationship to increases in both heart disease and certain types of cancers. So if I look here on the graph to the right, on the x-axis are the percent of calories per day that come from fat. On the y-axis, are the incidence of chronic heart disease per 1,000 people in a population. So if I look at people in the United States, that on average, people take in 40% of their calories come from fats and oils, where in Japan, only 
8 to 10 percent come from fats from oils and you can see the people of Japan have a much lower incidence of chronic heart disease than people in the United States but this is only one factor we also need to include the type of triacylglycerides that are consumed in other words is that population eating saturated fatty acids unsaturated fatty acids omega-3 fatty acids look at let's look at some populations where they have a more specific diet based on the type of fat they eat back in the 20th century it was found that the people that live in Greenland they have a very high fat diet but they also had a very low incidence of heart disease that's because again not all types of fats have the same impact it turns out that the Inuit population in Greenland they ate mostly codfish and other types of fish which were very rich in omega-3 fatty acids so no matter how much fat they ate during the day as long as they were eating omega-3 fatty acids they did not tend to have heart disease so if we contrast that to a typical American diet we have sufficient amounts of omega-6 fatty acids because we eat a lot of plants we do not eat as much fish as people would in Greenland so we're deficient in omega-3 fatty acids and in fact we have a much higher rate of heart disease and this may be due to the imbalance of omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids if we look at that ratio the ideal ratio that some nutritionists have come up with is that we need to have a ratio of approximately 4 to 10 grams of omega-6 fatty acids to at least 1 gram of omega-3 fatty acids to have a balanced nourishing diet of fatty acids and oils in humans most fatty acids can be synthesized in the human body however there are several fatty acids which are very essential to our lives that we cannot synthesize internally we call those essential fatty acids because they cannot be synthesized and they must be obtained from dietary sources two of the most important essential fatty acids are linoleic acid which is an 18 carbon fatty acid with two double bonds that is an omega-6 fatty acid one two three four five six and linolenic acid which is a polyunsaturated fatty acid again with 18 carbons but this time three double bonds this is also an omega-3 fatty acid one two three these are important because they're needed for in order to make sure that we have proper membrane structure around our cells they're also important because they're the starting materials for building longer carbon chain omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids for example like arachidonic acid deficiencies in these two fatty acids result in redness of skin often one is susceptible to infections and dehydration and one also may develop liver abnormalities that if you lack one of these two fatty acids the chemical reactions of triacylglycerols like any other organic molecule are dictated by the functional groups that are present if I look at a triacylglyceride there are ester linkages and there are double bonds those are the two different major functional groups in a triacylglycerol that can undergo a chemical reaction for the esters the typical chemical reaction both in the laboratory and in living organisms is a hydrolysis reaction in other words we add water across that ester linkage in the presence of an acid or base in the laboratory or in the presence of an enzyme catalyst in a living organism if we look at the double bonds in other words the alkenes in a triacylglyceride they undergo hydrogenation reactions where we add hydrogen across that double bond typically 
This is done in the laboratory to change the physical properties of the triacylglycerol. Let's take a look at those chemical reactions in a little more detail. If we look at the hydrolysis reaction of a triacylglycerol or a triglyceride in the laboratory, we take our triglyceride, we'd react it with some hydrogen gas at high temperature, being the steam. We would add water across that ester linkage to form my trialcohol, my glycerol, and three fatty acids. Notice in this case, the double bonds are not affected by this chemical reaction. We call this reaction in the laboratory complete hydrolysis. In other words, every one of the ester linkages is hydrolyzed. In living organisms, enzymes are the catalyst that initiates hydrolysis reactions, and they can be selective. In other words, I can do a partial hydrolysis reaction where only one or two of the ester bonds react, as shown in this example here. I have my triacylglycerol. In the presence of an enzyme in a living organism, I selectively do hydrolysis at the top ester and at the bottom ester, leaving the one in the middle alone. It all depends on the enzyme. In this case, I form two carboxylic acids or fatty acids, and I'm left with a diol, which still has an ester in it. We call this partial hydrolysis again, and this is usually done in living organisms to selectively determine what sort of fatty acids I release into the human body. Let's do a practice exercise where we write the structural equation for the acid catalyzed hydrolysis of a triacylglycerol. In other words, this is a laboratory chemical reaction where I'm using acid and some water and typically some heat. Also, when we've identified the carboxylic acids, let's write the shorthand designation for those resulting fatty acids. So when we do hydrolysis, I start to break these ester linkages. One of the molecules that we come up with, if we break all three of them, which would be the case of a laboratory-based hydrolysis reaction, I'm going to have glycerol here. I'm going to have my tri-alcohol molecule, and then I'm going to start writing down my fatty acids. I'm going to form one carboxylic acid. If I count carbons on there, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, the shorthand designation for this would be 12 colon 0 because it's a saturated fatty acid. The fatty acid that results from the hydrolysis of this ester linkage is also going to result in that 12 carbon fatty acid, it is also going to be a 12 0. If I look at the product of the hydrolysis of this ester linkage here, I'm going to form a 16 carbon fatty acid 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. And there is also no double bonds in there, so that's going to be a 16 0 fatty acid. If there are double bonds in my fatty acid, in other words, I have an unsaturated fatty acid, either a monounsaturated or a polyunsaturated, we can do a hydrogenation reaction where we're adding hydrogen across that double bond, just like we did when we talked about alkenes in the organic chemistry chapters. I take a double bond, I do an addition reaction to add hydrogen across that double bond to form the saturated alkane. So I'm going from alkene, unsaturated, to saturated alkane. If I look at triacylglycerols, many of them contain double bonds. In the presence of hydrogen gas and a catalyst, I can undergo a hydrogenation reaction to form 
a saturated triacylglyceride. Notice in this case that the ester linkages are still intact here. This is the process that we use to actually produce fats from oils. In other words, we do partial hydrogenation. We add just enough hydrogen to react several of these double bonds here, and we get partially hydrogenated fats and oils. In other words, I take peanut oil, I add hydrogen across some of the double bonds, I get peanut butter. I take vegetable oil, I add hydrogen across some of the double bonds, I get the solid margarine. So how does one limit the hydrogenation reaction, going from a total hydrogenation to partial hydrogenation? It's based on how much hydrogen I add and how long I actually heat that compound up. So if I use a lot of hydrogen gas, and I use a lot of time, I can do a total hydrogenation reaction. In other words, I add hydrogen across all the double bonds. If I limit the amount of hydrogen and I reduce the time of reaction and the temperature of the reaction, I can do partial hydrogenation, only doing hydrogenation on some of the double bonds. Notice that when I do that, I go from a triacylglycerol that has two unsaturated fatty acids and now one saturated fatty acid that's going to change the melting point which in turn determines whether it's going to be an oil or a solid fat. During that process of doing partial hydrogenation one also often produces trans fats. Okay, So if I look at the chemical reaction between a triacylglycerol with two unsaturated fatty acid residues. And when I react those with hydrogen gas to do a hydrogenation reaction, one of them actually tends to sometimes just start to become hydrogenated, but then it loses that hydrogen. And then I can go to the more stable form of the trans fatty acid residue. So in this chemical reaction, I went from two cis unsaturated fatty acids to one trans and one cis. It's these trans fatty acids that have been found to lower your good cholesterol levels. So eating trans fatty acid tends to be, according to nutritionists, not as healthy as eating cis fatty acids. One of the reasons may be that a cis fatty acid is made by nature, whereas a trans fatty acid shown here, which is also linear in nature because it's trans, those are the ones that are not considered as healthy in your diet. When one purchases food from the grocery store, those packages that they come in often have product labels, and those product labels often list nutritional facts about that product. Let's look at the nutritional facts of these two products, Fritos and Grandma's Cookies. If I look at the product label for Fritos, it has zero grams of trans fat and it's got three grams of saturated fat. If I look at Grandma's Cookies, which sounds good, it actually contains 1.5 grams of trans fat and up to 5 grams of saturated fats. And so if I just looked at the fat content and the type of fats, I would say it's better to eat Fritos than it is to eat Grandma's Cookies. The double bonds and triacylglycerols are also subject to oxidation reactions. In other words, I can add oxygen across that double bond. That oxygen we get is actually oxygen from the air. It's an oxidizing agent. So what that does is when I oxidize something, I start to actually break carbon-carbon bonds and tend to add oxygen to them. So if I look at an unsaturated fatty acid and I undergo an oxidation reaction, I get short chain alkyhydes when I add oxygen across that double bond. If it gets oxidized again, 
I can create short chain carboxylic acids. Carboxylic acids tend to have a strong odor where unsaturated fatty acids tend to be odorless. So if I take an unsaturated fatty acid and I leave it out, for example, like butter, if I leave it out long enough, it tends to oxidize and then it turns, turns into what we call a rancid odor that we can smell. To avoid that unwanted oxidation, we tend to add oxidants to our food to protect those double bonds from oxidizing. Typical additives include vitamin C and vitamin E. Both of those vitamins tend to be oxidized easier than double bonds, so we selectively oxidize these first before we start oxidizing carbon-carbon double bonds food preservatives. We'll talk more about vitamin C and vitamin E when we start discussing vitamins two chapters from now. The triacylglycerol that is shown here is the major component of coconut oil. How would one explain the fact that coconut oil is relatively shelf stable and does not require refrigeration upon opening and it typically does not need an antioxidant additive to it. If I look at this molecule, it's easy to notice that these are all saturated fatty acid residues, meaning there are no double bonds. So coconut oil contains solely saturated fatty acids. So these ones will not oxidize in the air and become rancidive. They're fairly unreactive. Let's just look at a summary of fatty acids. Most fatty acids contain an even number of carbons, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22. We are going to see in the metabolism chapters why that is true. I can subcategorize fatty acids into saturated fatty acids containing no double bonds, monounsaturated fatty acids, which contain one double bond, and polyunsaturated fatty acids, which contain more than one double bond, two or greater. I can then look at monounsaturated and polyunsaturated, and I can look at those as either being omega-3 fatty acids, omega-6 fatty acids, or something else. Omega-3 is that I look at the first double bond from the hydrophobic end, that's where I find the first double bond. Also, if I look at both monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fatty acids, all of the double bonds exist naturally as the cis stereoisomer, but we can create the trans stereoisomer when we're doing hydrogenation reactions. Let's now move on and discuss a second type of lipids. Those are the membrane lipids. All cells in animals are surrounded by a membrane that confines the contents of the cell, the nucleus and all the organelles. It also serves several other purposes. Up to 80% of the mass of a cell membrane is composed of lipids. Most of those lipids are what we call phospholipids. So if we look at a phospholipid, I have one ester linkage here going down to this saturated fatty acid. I have a second ester linkage going down to this monounsaturated fatty acid in this example. And I have a phosphate ester linkage going up to this phosphate group here. Hence the word phospholipid here. If I look at the structure of a cell membrane, notice that the non, it's a bilayer and that the nonpolar ends tend to be attracted to each other. And the polar ends, which is this phosphate group out here, it tends to be attracted to the solution that is on either side of that cell membrane, which is typically a water-based solution. So those are pointed out. They self-assemble into this very tough cell membrane. Notice there are 
other things here in the membrane also, including this little green thing, which is cholesterol, including this blue sort of blob, which is a protein. There's also some glycoproteins here, which are proteins with some carbohydrates sticking off of them. We call this whole cell membrane typically a phospholipid bilayer, and that surrounds cells in animals. Let's look at the definition of a phospholipid. A phospholipid contains at least one and maybe more fatty alcyl groups. That's the one shown in green here. It contains a phosphate group, which is shown here in yellow. It also contains a platform molecule, which can be different. It can either be the glycerol that we saw in triacyl glycerols, or it can be a different platform molecule, which is called a sphingosine, which I'll talk about in a second here. But in addition to those three groups, it also contains an R group that's attached to the phosphate group. And that's usually an alcohol that's sitting out here. Let's discuss each of these in a little more detail. We're going to discuss glycerophospholipids and sphingophospholipids. If we look at a glycerophospholipid, the glycerol indicates that my platform molecule, the one that holds all the other stuff together in one molecule, is the glycerol molecule, that trialcohol molecule. It's sort of the connection point between this fatty acid, this fatty acid, and my phosphate alcohol group here. Notice there's an ester linkage here, an ester linkage here. There's also a phosphoester linkage here, and there's also a phosphoester linkage here. So there's four ester linkages in here. So this would still be a, considered a saponifiable lipid because I can actually do a hydrolysis reaction at each of these ester linkages here. If we look at the structure of a glycerol phospholipid, they all contain the glycerol platform molecule. They contain two fatty acids, which could either be saturated or unsaturated fatty acids. They contain one phosphate group, and they contain what we call here an alcohol group, which can also differ. So if I look at choline, it contains an alcohol group that forms an ester linkage with my phosphate. It has an NCH3 taken three times, so it has a quaternary amine out there. It's charged, so that's a very polar part of the molecule. This part of the molecule is polar. That's my red dot on the last slides. This part of the molecule is my nonpolar tails in my bilayer. If I looked at how to pronounce the scientific name for that, that's a phosphatidylocholine. If I look at this molecule here, that is also an alcohol, which is the blue molecule out here. It contains two carbons and an NH3 group out here. This is also a quaternary amine and polar. We would pronounce it phosphatidylethanolamine. And finally, the third example that we're showing here, it contains an alcohol, it contains a carboxylate and my quaternary amine. That's a phosphatidylserine molecule. Let's look at the molecules and the process used to actually form a phospholipid. In this case, I'm going to use the example of a phosphatidylserine title ethanolamine molecule. I start off with one glycerol molecule, two fatty acid molecules, a phosphate and an alcohol shown down here in the colors that we used before. They will undergo a condensation reaction known as an esterification reaction in this case for all the bonds that are formed to form my phosphatidyl ethanolamine. Notice here in this case that this reaction also results in the liberation of four water molecules. Again, the reason we call it a condensation reaction. I've created four different ester bonds now. One, two, 
three, four ester bonds. This selectivity in putting this molecule together cannot be duplicated in the laboratory. I need living organisms and enzymes to actually act as the catalyst to put those together in the right way. Let's look at some of the similarities and differences between glycerol phospholipids and triacyl glycerols. If we look at them structurally, they both contain this glycerol platform molecule that holds everything else together. In the glycerol phospholipid, I contain two fatty acids. In the triacyl glycerol, I have three fatty acids bound to my platform glycerol molecule. In the case of the glycerol phospholipid, it contains a phosphate group and my alcohol group. Both of these, because they contain fatty acids, can serve as energy storages. I can do a hydrolysis reaction to break that ester linkage, release those fatty acids into the bloodstream, where I can do metabolism to break those long carbon chains down into smaller carbon chains and produce both energy and produce new mo carbon molecules to make bigger carbon molecules. The big difference between the two is the polarity. If I look at the glycerol phospholipids, they contain a nonpolar tail, but they also contain this very polar head group here because it contains that amine group out there, which is charged, or the carboxylate group out here was a charge. So in general, triacyl glycerols are considered to be nonpolar molecules if I look at them in three dimensions, where glycerol phospholipids are very polar and they're charged at the end. So I have a head region that likes water and I have a tail region that does not like water. If one were to take a glycerol phospholipid and literally just put it in some water, they would tend to self-assemble a little bit where this polar region would be attracted to the water molecules and this nonpolar region, the fatty acid portion, would be repelled by the water. So on the top, we tend to have the tail sticking up and the heads, which are polar, sticking down toward the water. If we look closely inside the water itself, we would find that they would also self-assemble to form bilayers here, where I'd have the polar part of the molecule sticking toward the water and the nonpolar parts sticking toward each other. We tend to make these bubbles or micelles, or we'd also tend to form these bilayers. These bilayers are also formed to protect cells in living organisms in animals. If I look at the membrane structure in a mammal, I can see that I have the nonpolar part of my phospholipids pointing toward another nonpolar part of a phospholipid. On the outside of the cell, I have water. My polar ends of my phospholipid will be attracted to that. On the inside of the cell, I also have water, and my, my polar ends of my second layer of phospholipid would be attracted to that. Even though each of these individual attractions is very small, when you put them all together, I have a very strong membrane that is put together to protect each cell. So I have the outside of the cell that contains water and my polar ends of the molecule, and I have the inside of my cell which contains water and the polar end of the molecule. In order to transport things from outside the cell to the inside of the cell, I need to either have holes in that membrane or I need something in that membrane as shown here in these yellow things to actually actively transport things from outside the cell into the cell and from inside of the cell out to the outside of the cell. A second and important type of lipid that is also a membrane lipid is a sphingophospholipid. It contains an 18 carbon monosaturated amino dialcohol called sphingosine, which is shown right here as the platform molecule. That is also shown here in the yellow right here, that's sphingosine. If I look at this molecule, I notice that it contains an 
amide linkage, there is a nitrogen right there, and it contains an ester linkage, and there's an alcohol functional group right there. So if we look at those, this nitrogen tends to form an amide linkage with fatty acids, and this hydroxyl group will form an ester linkage with a phosphate group and a second ester linkage with an alcohol. We call this a sphingophospholipid. This diagram here shows how I could take the sphingosine platform molecule, add all the different atoms in here. So here's my sphingosine platform molecule, which is the same as this yellow one here. Here is my amide linkage here to my fatty acid. In this case, it's steric acid, so it's a saturated fatty acid. I also have an ester linkage to my phosphate group, and I have a second ester linkage between my alcohol choline, in this case, to my phosphate group. Together, we call this whole molecule a sphingophospholipid. Again, this contains the charged part of the molecule, so it's also will be very polar, which means it also fun can function as a membrane lipid. If one looks at sphingolipids within the human body, we also find out that there are some molecules called sphingoglycolipids, which instead of containing a phosphate group, they contain a sugar group here. In this case, either a monosaccharide or an oligosaccharide here. These sphingoglycolipids are called cerebrosides because they actually tend to be mainly found in the brain. And if we look in the brain, it's about 7% of the dry mass of the brain is actually a sphingoglycolipid. They usually contain a monosaccharide, either glucose or galactose in this case. In this case, this example here is showing the D-galactose as my glyco group here. So the glyco represents the sugar, the sphingo represents the platform molecule, and the lipid is the whole molecule, but it's very similar in the fact that it contains this fatty acid residue. There are also some very complex sphingoglycolipids in the brain. They actually occur as either gray matter in the brain and also in the myelin sheath around the brain. These are often called gangliosides because they look kind of gangly, if you will. That's one interpretation. If I look at the structure of a sphingoglycolipid, again, I have a sphingosine. Let's see if we can identify it down here in this molecule. I look for my nitrogen, and I notice that this part is highlighted here in yellow is my sphingosine platform molecule. Then if I look up here, that's going to be my fatty acid residue with an amide linkage between the nitrogen and the carbonyl carbon. This whole group down here is going to be my oligosaccharide, which is a duff bunch of different monosaccharides bound together by glycosidic linkages. Let's now summarize the lipids that we've discussed based on either glycerol, which are our glycerol lipids, or sphingosine, which are our sphingolipids. In this first case here, my triacyl glycerol is considered an energy storage lipid because in the metabolism process in a living organism, I can break those bonds to liberate fatty acids. Those fatty acids then can go through a further metabolism process to break those up into smaller carbon molecules, which can be used to make other molecules like proteins and sugars. And in the process, they liberate energy. If I look at a glycerol phospholipid, it is considered a membrane liquid lipid because it is one of the main components of a cell membrane in animals, but it also contains fatty acid residues. So it can, in circumstances where we're in starvation, it can be used as an energy source also. The second category of membrane lipids is the sphingolipids where my sphingosine molecule here is my platform molecule 
In one case, my sphingophospholipid, I contain a phosphate group and an amino alcohol. This is, again, is my very polar end. This is my nonpolar end. And my second category of sphingolipids is my sphingoglycolipids, where the glyco represents a sugar. I still have my sphingosine platform molecule. I have one fatty acid residue chain, but I have a carbohydrate out here. When we talk about membrane lipids, we also have to include the lipid cholesterol in that discussion. It turns out that my phospholipid bilayer here also contains other components, and one of the major components in that membrane is cholesterol. This is the chemical structure of cholesterol. It contains four fused ring structures, plus this long nonpolar end here. If we look at the cell membrane, this cholesterol molecule actually acts to sort of break up the structure of this bilayer phospholipid structure to make it more fluid, if you will. Okay, so cholesterol acts as like a plasticizer. Too little cholesterol and the membrane is too fluid, too much cholesterol and the membrane becomes too rigid and you can break the membrane. It also, this cholesterol molecule plays an important role in the synthesis of hormones and vitamins essential for life. Let's look at some derivatives of cholesterol, which are either going to be steroids or hormones and are considered to be lipids. Let's now take a look at a third type of lipid called the chemical messenger lipids. These are molecules that are transported throughout the body, either in the circulatory system or in the lymph system. These molecules are sent out to tell cells to either start making molecules or to stop making molecules. And we'll see some examples of that in the following section. One form of a messenger lipid is a steroid. If we look at the chemical structure of a steroid, they tend to have this steroid nucleus in common with all steroids. In other words, they contain three six-membered rings fused together along with one five-membered ring fused to that. So this is the steroid nucleus and then other atoms are actually attached here to define what type of steroid it is. The term hormone is used to describe a biochemical substance that is based on the steroid nucleus and it is produced by a ductless gland where the cells in that gland produce that hormone, they enter into the circulatory system, and they communicate with the various tissues around the circulatory system. Some hormones that are lipids include the sex hormones, which control both reproductive and secondary sexual characteristics, and these are all derivatives of cholesterol. The adrenal corticoid hormones, they control many of the biochemical processes in the body. These are also derivatives of cholesterol. And there is a third time type of hormone which does the not contain this steroid nucleus. It is called the eicosanoid derivatives of, and they're derivatives of a arachidonic fatty acid. The sex hormones can be categorized into three major groups. Estrogens are the female sex hormones. Androgens are the male sex hormones, and the progestins are the pregnancy hormones. If I look at an example of each of these, notice that they all contain that steroid background, four fused rings, six-membered, 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 five-membered. The only difference in these is what sort of functional groups are attached to them. In the case of estradiol, which is the hormone most responsible for the secondary female characteristics. It contains a hydroxyl group, an aromatic ring, and a hydroxyl group attached to my steroid backbone here. Testosterone, which is responsible for secondary male characteristics, 
It contains my steroid background. It contains a hydroxyl group, an alkene, and a carbonyl group. Progesterone, which is the primary progestin that prepares the uterus for pregnancy, it also contains that four fused ring system. It also contains that carbonyl group and that double bond, very similar to testosterone. But in this case, it contains a two carbon carbonyl group out here. These very small difference play a large difference in the living organisms. These hormones, at least the functionality of these hormones, has been synthesized in the laboratory to produce what we call synthetic derivatives. If we look at the norethanodrel, that's synthetic progesterone, notice that it contains an alkyne group out here. It looks very similar to the progestin here, other than that one group out there, but it has the same effect in living organisms. RU483, that is also known as a synthetic abortion drug. And finally, the methandrolestrolone is a synthetic tissue building steroid. All of these contain, again, those four fused ring. It's just a difference in all the different functional groups and where they are. Depends on how they function. What sort of messages do they send in the living organism? Another class of hormones that are produced in the adrenal gland are the adrenal corticoid hormones. Again, the adrenal gland is a small organ located on top of each of the kidneys. There have been 28 different hormones that have been isolated from the adrenal cortex of the adrenal gland. Those include the mineral corticoids. Those are the hormones that actually send messages to cells to help balance the levels of sodium potassium within the cells. If we look at an example of a mineral corticoid, one of them is aldarastone, and you can see here, again, it contains that steroid background. If we look at a second class of adrenal corticoids, one of them is the glucocorticoids, and it controls met glucose metabolism and counteracts inflammation. An example of that is cortisol. Again, a five-membered steroid background with some functional groups out here. Scientists have also been able to actually synthesize these hormones. We call them steroids in this case. This one is cortisone. It is an anti-inflammatory drug. This one is predostinolone. It is an anti-inflammation drug also. Again, they look very similar in structure, but they do have similar types of functionality within living organisms. Another type of messenger molecule that are lipids are the eicosanides. These molecules are actually derivatives of arachidonic acid, which is a fatty acid with 20 carbons and four double bonds. The structure is shown here of arachidonic acid. Eicosanoids are hormone-like molecules, but they do not travel through the circulatory system. They literally send their message just locally they usually, those messages are in the same tissues in which they are synthesized, just different cells within that tissue. Eicosanoids usually have a very short lifetime, but they do have profound physiological effects, and they're usually present in very low concentrations. Some of those physiological effects include the inflammatory response, the production of pain and fever, the re regulation of blood pressure, the induction of blood clotting, the control of reproductive functions, such as the induction of labor, and it also is important in the regulation of the normal sleep-wake cycle. Let's take a look at three different types of eicosanoids. The first one we'll look at is the prostaglandins. These are eicosanoids that contain a cyclopentane ring shown here, and some oxygenated functional groups, carbonyl group, a hydroxyl group, and a hydroxyl group. 
Here is my 20 carbon arachidonic acid background that originated from my fatty acid. Prostaglandins are involved in raising the body temperature. They also inhibit secretion of gastric juices in the stomach, and they increase the secretion of protective mucus layer in the stomach. They're also involved in relaxing and contracting smooth muscle tissue, directing water and electrolyte balance throughout that tissue, intensifying pain, and enhancing the inflammatory response. A second type of eicosanoid-based messenger lipid are the thromboxanes. These are eicosanoid derivatives that contain a ether cyclic ring out here. So I have a six-membered heterocyclic ring which contains oxygen. I also contain oxygenated functional groups out here. I also have my 20-carbon arachidonic acid backbone. These thromboxanes are important when because they promote platelet aggregation. A third type of eicosanoids are the leukotrienes. Leukotrienes are eicosanoid derivatives that contain three conjugated double bonds. One, two, three. Not sep they're just separated by uh, one carbon going on there and some hydroxyl groups. And they promote in the inflammatory and hypersensitivity responses in the body. Let's look at the two following molecules and let's see if we can determine how we would classify each of the following eicosanoids. If I look at this first one here, it's obvious that I have a five-membered ring with some oxygenated components, so this would be a prostaglandin. If I look at the second molecule here, I see no rings, but I see three conjugated double bonds, double bond, double bond, bond double bond next to each other. So these would be a leukotriene. Let's now look at the fourth class of lipids, the emulsification lipids. Emulsification lipids are often referred to as bile acids. They're produced in the liver and they're transported down through the bile duct to and stored in the gallbladder. These emulsification lipids function as an emulsifier which is used to disperse and stabilize water insoluble substances like fat globules in the body, and actually make colloids of them that are now soluble in aqueous solution. So if I need fat for energy at some point, I can take those flat globules, the liver produces bile, stored in the gallbladder, it's sent through the gallbladder into the intestines, where it acts to actually break up that flat glob globule and make it water soluble, where it can enter into a metabolism process to get energy out of it. Let's now discuss briefly the fifth category of lipids, and those are our protective coating lipids. Many plants actually produce a protective coating lipid on the leaves that protects them from absorbing excess water through the cells in their leaves. We often call these biological waxes because they have that sort of consistency of a hydrophobic wax. They repel water. Biological waxes are monoesters of long chain fatty acids shown here in the purple and long chain alcohol shown here in the blue. They form an ester linkage to form a very nonpolar type of material, often called a wax. These waxes typically contain between 14 and 36 carbons, making them a nonpolar. The carbon bonds can either be saturated or unsaturated. An example of a biological wax is carnauba wax which is a 29 carbon chain on the fatty acid residue and a 32 carbon chain on the alcohol residue. 
And that ends our discussion on lipids. We're now going to move on and talk about proteins.